I'd like to discuss um, a couple of personnel matters, the clerk's office and recreation department. Make motion to exit the session for those two items. Second it. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. We have an amended agenda. We have a, an energy plan to look at in a homestead abatement. So I move we go into we accept the uh, amended agenda. Amended agenda as listed. I'll second it. For discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Select board meeting minutes of September 2, 2020. The additions, changes, or corrections. the orders. Any question on the orders? Uh, I see there's a $1,232 looks like ammunition purchase for the police department. I can't say that I've ever seen such a ammo bill at one time. What's the purpose of this? I don't know that it's how it stands up with other purchases, but I know that there is a budget for ammunition and this was the cycle to do it so that they could do their uh, rifle range training a few days ago. It took like a day and a half at the rifle range for all the various officers to come in and do their proficiency testing. Yeah. But I can I can look at the previous numbers if you like and see if there's anything. Uh, well, I, the one thing I can tell you, ammo is, is, expensive. is expensive right now because it's pretty much non-existent. Yeah, yeah. So the prices have gone Probably up really significantly. Mm -hmm. like well, actually, speculation, things. that kind of thing. Oh boy. Well, it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's just with what's going on. Yep. Another thing that got kind of got my attention uh, one of the fire trucks oil changed $771. It must be more than just an oil change or <laughs> what is this one that goes through the whole thing? I change oil through. and big diesel engines and yeah. it don't cost me $700 for filters so, and oil. Right. Their total servicing rates for the whole truck. Uh, this our annual every every June it goes through it and towards the end of the fall. It's when they do it. I'm sure that's what it was. So do you want to tell me what line item we're looking at? Uh, who's looking at? What who's the vendor? 490. 490? It's probably something about. Yeah. Tell you if I can find something. Yeah, it's central Vermont truck repair. Right just seemed like just for an oil change. It, they yeah, there's usually more to the story. To yeah. We've got oil filter, fuel filter, fuel filter, oil, lamp, valve, three-way, male connector, 90 push lock, and this is a service station inspection as well. Yeah, I see that. That makes a big difference. Lots of little things add up. Yeah. Any other questions on the orders? Tonight's was just a little larger than the supplemental usually is because we have three weeks before our next meeting, so we loaded it up a little.
you all set up, sorry, that I'm going to your paperwork. I'll be done in a second. I'm really glad. having a hard time getting a call out. You don't have to dial 802 for them. I know, but then I did for the third time just to check it. All right, we'll get them later. We'll I'm probably in call out. Board. I'm sorry? I'm in here. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in terms of um, coronavirus update, the town has taken delivery of our Zoom-friendly equipment and deployed it in the town office conference room. The setup should enable boards and commissions to meet in person and virtually with guests and members of the public who cannot be present due to social distancing protocols or for other reasons, just convenience. <coughs> Training for use of this equipment will be provided by Vermont Digital and is set to take place here tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock here in the conference room. The town, as you know, has applied for grant funds to reimburse it for the cost of the equipment, plus all of our other COVID-19 expenses. We just received a note today saying we should hear any day as to the success of that grant, but that most towns will be seeing most or all of their grant requests granted. Helen McKinley reports that the town's land record digitization grant uh, was successful and we got word on that I think today there might be something in your packet I think to confirm that in the requested amount of nineteen thousand six hundred and fifty dollars again to bring up more land records into our electronic COTS review system which I think takes our land records further back in time which was the whole idea to facilitate remote land record searches that kind of thing the town plans to sign a contract with Casella for the Depot Hill sewer pump station project um, soon with work anticipated to begin right after Thanksgiving. Um, audit. Last week the town underwent its annual external audit administered by the firm of Sullivan and Powers. Preliminary feedback, and this is just preliminary, suggests that we experienced a healthy surplus in the general fund on the order of $48,000, $50,000, and a modest deficit in the highway fund approximating about fourteen dollars or $15,000. Stay tuned, of course, for more details when we have more of the audit and it's finalized uh, over the next um, few months. Um, Veterans Day, uh, based on the select board's go-ahead at the last meeting, I've begun to reach out and talk to others about putting a program together for what will be an all-outdoor event this year. Uh, thus far, I've secured the participation of a keynote speaker and a clergyman. Initial feedback from Jeff Carrera with the Scouts is also favorable. Uh, and I've got an inquiry into the school music department. And of course, as you know, they're dealing with lots of stuff. And they'll probably touch base with me closer to the event in mid-October or so. Let me know what might be feasible for music. Um, Robin Rowe has uh, suggested that she's planning to resign or retire as director of the Pittsburgh Food Shelf. She's been working at this for more than 20 years to spend more time with family now. She's looking for a replacement. Anyone who's interested in learning more or with a tip as to who would be a good candidate to replace her should get in touch with Robin Rowe about that. A copy of her email is included in your packets tonight. Um, finally, the truck route will be closed for an additional weekend this coming Saturday and Sunday so they can install the concrete panels at the improved railroad crossing on the truck route. Thereafter, there will be some paving on the transition points of both sides of the railroad crossing, which will involve just limiting traffic to a single lane for a short period of time, we hope. Uh, you can see an email thread between me and the state about Greg Markowski's suggestion that the town offer some um, resources toward extending any paved uh, transition. Basically, the state says they know the need for a smooth transition, they're planning for a smooth transition in their own project, and that um, if we were to get involved, it would be very expensive and unnecessary. So we told them, let, we'll see how the project turns out. We can always revisit this at another time if we want to put any money into what they've done. But to collaborate does not seem like a good idea at the time, especially since we've already agreed that we didn't want to spend a penny more than our paved budget. So that's all I've got. Any comments or questions for John and the board? 
I just had one thing. I was in here first thing this morning, and Helen told me about that grant to digitize the records. Yeah. She was pretty excited. Yeah. And it, from what she told me, it appears people will now, once this is done, be able to title search back 40 years. Mm. And exactly. it basically takes us back pretty close, or if not to the point where stuff was being handwritten. Mm -hmm. So it gets a lot of our records. And 40 years is key if we can hit that because that's what a title policy title. is based right. on. Yeah. So if you're going to do a title search to sell a home, that's really all you need. Yeah. So that would be great if it goes that far back. That's, she seemed to believe that it was going to get us back there. So I just wanted to let people know that. Anything else? Any select board members? Remarks this evening? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, got a phone call a couple days ago from an irate landowner. Um, I bet I know who. No, you, I'm sure you know who. And it was due to some ditching along his property, the stone line ditches and whatever. Uh, I've talked to Chad. I asked Chad, did you talk to this person ahead of time just to let him know what you were going to be doing? which Chad said, well, no, I didn't. And I'm not saying we need a written policy, but maybe going forward, just having the road foreman talk to the person and explain what it is we're doing and why we're doing it might, might be a good thing to do. If I could respond. Um, this gentleman was well aware of our plans last fall because we um, were talking to him about that last fall. Uh, Chad, I think, had some interaction with him in the fall. I know I did. We explained it. He um, seemed, I won't say satisfied, but he seemed to understand that we can't let people veto roadside projects to maintain our roads. This latest um, round was kicked off when we were actually doing the work. and That kind of stirred up the hornet's nest. I had more conversations with him and again, I don't think I was successful to kind of make him any happier with the project, but I did my best to explain that a lot of it comes from the feds who are leaning on the state to clean up the lake, and that part of this is stormwater management to make sure that sediment from storms doesn't make its way into local water bodies and then eventually into the lake. Um, he felt adamant that because of the layout of his land, no stormwater was going to make its way into the brook, let alone the lake. Nevertheless, I did follow up with Devon at the Regional Planning Commission to confirm that what we're doing uh, seemed to be appropriate based on his understanding of what the state wants for road maintenance. He said he actually visited the site and said we were doing a bang-up job. I also talked with somebody from the state named Jim Ryan, who's kind of overseeing a lot of these um, grants designed toward getting towns to take these best management practices and put them in place, and uh, he basically confirmed that we're taking the right approach. And it's not willy-nilly. We have the road inventory, which lists all of the hydrologically connected segments. This has been identified, so it's been on our work list. <clears throat> and again, bottom line, I'm very sorry, and I told this person that I was very sorry that he doesn't like the project, but that we're going to go forward with it, and I think it's close to being concluded. And I'd be happy to talk about it further with you, Dave. Well, no, like. I, I, but I just, maybe, and in, in, in Chad did say he talked to him last fall, but maybe the day before you know, a week before or whatever, just saying, hey, remember what we told yeah. you, blah, blah, blah. I agree. That, it just might, I agree. That's always a good you know, policy. is it going to solve the problem, but it might de-escalate it a little bit. Yeah. Okay. I, I appreciate it. Just a suggestion. Yeah. I appreciate it. It's a good idea. Always a good idea to also good knock on doors. Communication is key. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other remarks? I'm assuming we don't have any public comment this evening. There's no public. <laughs> 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 so we'll switch things around and we'll take the Vill Pittsburgh Village Farm next. Great. Thank you, Hank. So I'm Lori Byram. I think I know everyone now. i um, been here a few times. This is Gisela Keller and you know Louis Goudreau, I think. And you probably know Gisela as well. So we are, the first thing I want to say is we're not here to ask for any town money. 
nor will we ever be, we hope, in a position to ask for town money. But what we are in the, in, in the business of is trying to get the three wishes that the townspeople expressed in those March meetings a couple of years ago, a community center out of a building that's in the center of town, uh, a possibility of some retail space and an agricultural hub of some kind. Um, so the board of the Pittsburgh Village Farm on which Louie and I sit decided we needed to make a strategic plan to help us fast forward into meeting those goals. Uh, we did that this summer. Gisela was our facilitator. And the reason we're coming tonight, and thank you very much for giving us the time, is to let you know um, that I think any of you know that that building is going to need serious renovation, a reconstruction in some parts of it. In order to cover the cost of that, we are in the business of getting grant money. There are some significant grant dollars out there right now for things like community centers because people haven't been able to gather and the state recognizes that that would be important. Um, so many of the larger grants that we need require indication in some fashion of the town's full support of going forward to get the building renovated and get the grant money. So what you might be in a position of helping us would be to sign off on these grants that we would be writing that just indicates that to the, the uh, grantors that we have the town support in going forward to get this building up and running. So with that background, Gisela is going to walk you through some of the strategic plan and then Louie and I and Gisela will be happy to answer any of your questions. But that's the background. Perfect. Um, so yeah, I wish your your um, TV system will be because we have a very beautiful plan with lots of pictures and the most beautiful picture is the one with a panel discussion at the strategic plan <laughs> workshop where David Mills kindly joined us and gave us actually some feedback which is now included in the strategic plan. So we would love to send this to you via email or come back and give you the really nice, beautiful. But um, I is just. It, is, it, is it on your website? Because we do have a link to your website in our latest newsletter. Not yet, but we want to post it uh, actually next week and maybe to, you know, to also wanted to wait for this meeting and see whether you, you know, have any feedback, suggestions. and. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Um, so, um, as Laurie said, the you know we wanted to ground the strategic plan on a community gathering plus the three priorities made in 2018 at the town hall meetings: a community gathering place, an agricultural hub, and a commercial retail space. And so, we wanted to fill these priorities with life and. Just some quick facts about Pittsford Village Farm. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization governed by a board, and two members are here. Um, we, um, we were focusing on Pittsford, but also on Procter Brandon and Chittenden down the road. But first of all, we want to get um, focus on Pittsford. We have like 50 volunteers and hours and hours and 500. You know, who spent 500 hours, a number of programs which you may ho hopefully have seen, like a community garden, a uh, flea market, um, 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 ch children's outdoor play, um, and um, so this is who we are. And through the strategic planning process and also through that panel discussion, we, we arrived at some key lessons learned. And one is we must better understand community needs, expectations, and likes overall. And I think David said, you know, some people think you're just you, but you know, you you have never reached out, and you're a bit elitist. And we thought, oops, yeah, we need to we need to change that. So that was an important lesson learned. Um, we must bridge the gap and bring the perspective of young people. We, also, the technology gap. We must be, become much more active with Facebook and Twitter. I mean, we'll, we'll need staff eventually, um, and we and one of the lessons learned is a stronger relationship with Pittsburgh Town. So this is why one of the reasons why we're here, um, and the early childhood education will be a center, will be a first big priority, which is also aligned with statewide needs. Here's a list of our strategic partners. I will not go through that, but you're you're among our strategic partners, of course. Um, we defined our mission and values. Um, 
like inclusiveness, diversity, serve and create community, contribute to the well-being of our community, involve all community voices, and build on the work of others, collaborate and cooperate, do not compete. And then we arrived at these strategic goals. And number one, restore the historic farmhouse. As Laurie said, that's going to be our number one priority. Uh, strengthen the board and management. We, know we, are, we are now talking a lot about to grow the board from currently um, eight to 12 members to, to come up with a fundraising plan to, and, and implement it to come. We, we found somebody who's doing now Facebook and Twitter and, 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 and marketing for us and really strengthen the operation. Um, then number C, develop the early childhood education and boost small business and retail. D, create a vibrant community center and E, the agricultural hub. And this is not a prioritization, it's just more or less the sequence of how we're gonna attack these priorities. And then I thought, you know, for you, since you're all always monitoring budget, it would be nice to ask, so how do they make this work? So we have an income, Scenario, and you'll see sort of 50% childcare, 13% uh, events, retail, flex office space, donations, and grants. And then on the expenses side, um, also events, staff, a reserve, maintenance, property tax, utilities. And um, I would like to, and then we defined all the objectives and um, of all these priorities of these strategic goals. But I would like to stop here because we would really love to hear from you and love to answer any questions you might have and then can kind of dig deeper. Is that okay? Go on. Any questions? I'd like to make a comment. I think it's a, this is a great idea. I've had limited involvement in it over the years, but I have been in favor of the town collaborating in some way, and this appears to be the best way to do it. No, and I would I would agree. I mean, it's like I told you. You know, it, it's it's a great idea, but the townspeople don't want to have to pay for it, and that's. Yeah. You know, that's that. the bottom line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. And but I have no objections whatsoever to us supporting what you're doing because I think it's it's a great thing. I mean, in in from a simplistic perspective, the better you make that house, the more property taxes you get. There so you know. I mean just from an economic yeah. you know, so to you know, the more you do there, the more it benefits the town not only socially but also financially. I think it's important for everyone to know that we, we have been successful, a little unprofessional group of grant writers, myself and Gisela and Louie's wife Nancy and Donna Wilson, um, we have gotten money to support the Tunes Day, which we then had to cancel, but the concerts we had last year, we just got a grant, a successful grant to pay for a grant writer who will research where the big money is because that house, as you might guess, is going to need $500,000, not little bits of $3,000 nibbles, you know. And so this person will come on board and will work with us to get that big money. Um, and then we, we really hope some of these grants allow for things like $10,000 to go to the fire department because the volunteer fire department will take on some responsibility once it's a community center. Um, so I really think um, there's no downside to this and no financial hit that we can see um, and I, I'm hoping that people that the four of you might feel it sounds like you're favorably disposed to signing off on some of these grants that require a select board sign off which is really where we are Louie you want to no, let's see on another really good partner for us on a different topic is um, Eric Millett and Paramount so we were going to have the Vermont Symphony Orchestra on the property. That fell through. I mean, they got canceled for the season. But we have um, gone through the zoning administration. We have permission for six concert. The southwestern part of that property is a natural amphitheater. Um, it replicates pretty much what was available at Mountaintop Inn. 
when they had the concert there. So it's moving from the mountaintop to Pittsburgh. And so we can do that, term, that concert plus five more. So that's a really um, a big draw. It could be a thousand people coming to a concert, but it adds a little bit more recognition for the town. And that's a really a good benefit for the town. So there's a there's some there's some good relationships we're building. And go ahead, David. No, I just no, that's good. The other thing, as you said that, and I've noticed Brandon's got mm -hmm. one. The drive-in. Uh, the drive-in, and and again, like I said before, your your concerts are catering to this part of town. Right. Have something else. So maybe if you've got that area, maybe once a month you have a, whether it's a drive-in or a sit, whatever, sit-in, you have a movie. Mm -hmm. You I know, think, yeah. something for those who of us who aren't necessarily going to go to a concert. I thought your remarks were very helpful that day. And, um, you know, I think we already have started to think about what kinds of other events might draw people. Um, and one of the neat things is that Eric Millette is an old Pittsburgh boy, you know. Um, so he has a lot. Did you know that? He's young. A, yeah. He's a young Pittsburgh boy. He, uh, <laughs> all relative. I think so. He was a he was an Otter Valley student and, you know, knows a lot about Pittsburgh. So uh, when we met with the zoning board folks, um, he came along. And um, I, it, it's, it's easy to see that he understands the town. He, he also understands the diversity that we're hoping for in terms of the kinds of events that you are pushing us towards. And um, I think you were really hurt and it was so nice that you made the time to come up and, and help us see that. So. Yeah, I'd say as a counterpoint to the concerts, maybe classical music, Touch a Truck was a good yeah. way to have a broad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Tuesday thing yeah. was family based and mm -hmm. folk singers, and you know, yeah. it could be a rock band. Remember when we were talking yeah. about oh, it? Yeah, yeah. Um, to get some of the people that like that sort of music out. Yeah, so once we are beyond COVID and we're doing more events, we also really like to capture your ideas and your knowledge and your expertise and, and also not only here, but also really to be more strategic in our outreach and, and really reach out to the town and, and, and hear people say, so what, what, what bubble people like and what do people need and, you know, is it yoga classes, is it, is it you know, what is it? So we, we really want to get a really good sense of what's, what, how we can serve the community. I, I don't know if any of you had heard about the, the Early Childhood Center, but we already had almost $60,000 from Let's Grow Kids in order to help meet the state um, the downturn in the number of spots for kids when parents are working. Um, they're they're pro poised to give us the money back again, but we had to cancel it when we realized that the infrastructure for the house wouldn't allow for the kind of um, health and re safety regulations that we need. Um, but we think that's going to bring parents in who are going to drop off their kids, not park all over the place, but maybe get a cup of coffee at, at Kamuda's and, you know, maybe go next door and, and uh, do something with Keith's. You know, who knows what it will be, but to bring in a few more people that are going to drop off kids and create a few jobs for Pittsburgh graduates, um, all of that is very exciting to us. As it, even as it meets a need that we have for more spots for child care. Great. Well, when we get that big old grant written, well, we'll call up John and come back and see you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure we'll probably sign up. We Thank have, you very yeah. much. Yeah. We that's have an architect that's working on it um, now. We'll be meeting with him as part of our meeting tomorrow night. So we're making progress on the layout of the building, on the layout of the site. Um, it's slow. It's been slow progress, but um, it's still moving forward. It's the kind of thing. You know, people, volunteers, have moved a board here, taken down a wall here and there, and all of a sudden, what you see underneath is worse than what you started with. <laughs> oh, uh, you know? I'm so sure. Yeah. Some yeah. people are in that business. They know, <laughs> know how that goes. So, thank you very much for your time. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks for coming. Take good care. We'll see you again. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks for coming. That closed business. I think we've already had that discussion, Mr. Chairman. Don't get on the records, Director. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I put a memo in your packet and I'll explain it a little bit again so we can talk to the folks at home. 
The town has hired a new recreation director with a start date of Monday, December 14th. He is Nelson Brown, a Waitsfield native, 28 years of age with a BS in res res recreation management and a minor in business administration. His work background is in recreation, having served as the assistant recreation director in the resort town of Waterville Valley, New Hampshire for several years, as his attached resume and cover letter notes. As we discussed, um, we wanted to start him relatively down the road because programming is not too busy with COVID restrictions. Um, and we thought uh, maybe December or January would be a good time to start him. He'll maybe have some opportunity early on to look at economic development. And he certainly has expressed an, an interest and willingness to do that. And of course, his minor in uh, business administration, no doubt, will be helpful on that. Um, as I noted originally, the town received 12 applicants from, from strong applicants, um, applications from strong applicants for the job. We um, reviewed those in by way of a committee that we set up for the purpose of recruiting our next recreation director. Now, that committee consisted of myself, Randy Adams, who was gracious enough to participate, and three members of the recreation committee who volunteered to serve. Those were Rob Ketchum, Kelly Connaughton, and Monica Keith. We also had the participation and support of Bill Moore, who's the recreation director over in Brandon, who again does both recreation and economic development. So we appreciated everybody's uh, thorough work through several sessions at which we scrutinized applications, resumes. Uh, ultimately, we checked on references and uh, were very pleased with the references for our three finalists and particularly those for Nelson. Pretty much everybody he seems to have worked for and with gave glowing recommendations for him, both as a person and for his varied skill set. So we're excited to have him aboard. Um, the, um, again, the plan is to have him come down. He couldn't make it tonight, but to come down to an October 7th select board meeting. He will meet with the members of the board, get introduced, He'll also meet with the rest of the rec committee members, and he'll have a chance to meet with staff beforehand. Uh, and of course, we're going to take advantage of this little gap to gather information for him about the recreation uh, department and what our programming over the years has looked like. And we're also gathering information from people like the newly merged Regional Chamber of Commerce and um, and. Re Economic Development Corporation in the Rutland region through Lyle Jepson. We hope to help him create kind of mentorships so he can learn what those folks and Bill Moore might be doing on economic development. So I guess I'm just very excited to announce this hiring and um, look forward to getting him on board and getting him productive in both his pursuits, primarily recreation, but to the extent he can do it, uh, economic development as well. Good. Good. Go ahead. Now, will he still be living in Waitsfield and commuting he has back a, and forth? He has a lease yeah, until a lease. June, but he has said he'd look into moving at that point when the lease is up. Okay. Meanwhile, when I see him in October, I'm going to hand him some research I found uh, through my legal background about how one might break really? a lease or renegotiate <laughs> it. Because I'm not opposed to him coming down sooner if that's possible. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's a lot of commute. It is. It is, especially in the winter. Yeah. yeah. All right, good. So we're headed in the right direction. Options for the village sidewalk. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I don't have much new to report other than what I told uh, Selectman Mills the other day. I spoke with um, Tim Rice at Wilp, and he reports that if we were to try, and I haven't yet run this by the state, if we were to try to convert our plan for a concrete curb to asphalt, that we might be looking to save eight to ten thousand dollars it's not a big savings so I think the question for the board is would you like to rebid the thing with more flexibility on timing or simply politely decline the state's offer of the grant money that's been offered I say we politely decline I think I agree that's a lot of money it's for something that's going to be torn out I mean it's it all sounded good it's 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 a safety issue. I mean, we all get that, but there's the monetary side of it too. Yeah. 
And, and I do feel the know, state's been quite patient, waiting for us to sort it out. Yeah, so well, so if we could give them, if we could give them a final response, that would probably I be well we received. I think we should do. So we respectfully decline it. But if there's any, and I guess, yeah, if we respectfully that part, I agree with. Going back to some of the stuff Joe has said over <laughs> the years at this point, mm -hmm. you know, if there's a way we could just paint some light, do something, yes. even those reflective markers or yeah. something to differentiate between it the sidewalk and the road. Right. Because mm -hmm. that's the, the different, the differentiation is the big thing. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, Maybe a reflective stripe that was down there, they're putting these bicycle lanes. Did you notice that one over on Route 4? Yeah. Not this wide, it's, it's tape. Yeah. It's oh. not paint, it's not paint, it's tape. tape. They groove it in. That's something just something so Maybe. people know that that isn't, yeah, the road. Not the road is, yeah. yeah. If this is a big problem down there from a safety standpoint, I've never heard Mike Waffle mention it. I have never heard Mike say, well, he has spent time there and he, he's never really give us a big push to do what we've talked about doing. Well, I think there's been a lot of anecdotes from people who've seen yeah. people passing well, on the right hand, hand side. I've had a couple so, of people tell me I that they are on the sidewalk and somebody pulls out the pass and almost hits them. I, I mean, we've been that. fortunate. I yeah. can see that and happening. And I probably, I, I witnessed a state trooper having a car stop oh, on the sidewalk yeah. here back not too long ago. Yeah, what, what sidewalk? Yeah. Well, 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 that's, well, that's, that's the problem. You can't, you can't well, tell it's a sidewalk. Well, what would be wrong with asking Mike to donate, or not donate, but schedule some time there to see how bad that is. Well, that Have could, somebody park there. If we had something like that in terms of data, that might help us argue to VTrans for the need for some Right, right. we've never done that, have we? I don't think in a, in, a, in, a, in a concerted way, no. I don't think that no. Mike has ever come to us and said, look, I spent Ten hours there, over uh, or twenty-four hours there, we spent more time checking up on a dog that was across from the mobile station. We had Mike sit at the mobile station all one night. To, to was, it, was it tape recorded, recording nothing, as uh, I understand yeah, it? That's right. <laughs> now, along those lines, you're talking. What does Rutland Regional Planning Commission have anything that can monitor that kind of stuff? Rather than taking yeah. time from our yeah. police force, that would be a first we're, question. we're paying them to do stuff for yeah. us anyway. We might so They're good at traffic studies and measuring speeds. I don't know about this and that, well, it, but it, I'll think ask it's, worth, it's yeah. worth asking the question. Yeah, I agree. I don't think that that area down there is even signed the way it could be mm -hmm. and maybe should be. Well, uh, I know. Has, has anybody ever looked at it from that standpoint to see if there was signage is good I, I don't could be better i, don't, I haven't heard I don't about recall it. it but i know we've had unsuccessful conversations with vtrans about recommended signage in the past they've taken a very much it's our road standpoint but we can certainly ask yeah yeah i know the state has to approve anything yeah. you do yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah they might not have to approve uh, Law enforcement officer sitting there in somebody's yard watching it. I'm not but sure. But I think about we've that. got four things we could do as our as our cheap alternative: line striping suggestion, signage, police observation, but better yet, regional planning commission um, data awesome. collection. Yeah. I mean, if all else fails, and I'm well, I'm going to say this because I'm just me. We got a whole lot of guardrail posts down at the dump, and every four feet, drive one of them in on the edge of our sidewalk, and in the middle of the night, and then we problem solved. <laughs> well, <laughs> the <state> of us. <laughs> I'm afraid the state will give them. Well, yeah, it'll well, take them at least a week or two to get them out. Yeah. <laughs> we have to look at the future because we're going to be spending a lot of money on Route 718 for the infrastructure. Oh, yeah. We don't want to piss the state off now. No, I know, I know. So we're talking I'm, three to five million dollars. I'm joking. Yeah. And I think, especially given COVID and the focus on trying to keep our books uh, on a good, solid basis for taxpayers, they'll understand us backing out of the project. I, I would hope so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a lot of money right now. Yeah. Well, it's, well, it's, yeah. 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 All right, update on the Salshed project. Uh, yes, uh, there'll be a pre-construction meeting Friday the 18th here in the conference room at 10 a.m. And there's even talk of breaking ground next week. Wow. 
So that's wow. hyper. That's hyper speed um, to do at least the site work uh, and the asphalt um, paving before plants here, close so down. That kind of thing. Eighteen. Yeah. Ten a.m. Yep. Ten a.m. Yeah. I have. Mr. Chairman. David. So, the last, and again, me being me, uh, the last conversation we had on this sand shed, we were talking about moving our sand pile into it. Personally, we've gotten along with our sand pile being outside. The cost of moving that into that shed to me is just a waste of money. Oh, you say, I, what, I'm, what, really what I'm proposing is once it's built, any new sand we get goes into it. But we use our sand pile outside for this winter until it's gone. Because it's it's a lot of wasted energy, time, money, diesel fuel, moving sand from one place to another. Just my opinion. Okay. Makes sense. I agree with you on that one. I'm not happy with yeah. the price we're paying for that shed, and I know you're not oh, no. impressed with it either. No. But I'd rather see a hundred thousand dollars of our tax dollars be semi wasted on that than on that sidewalk. Well, much more permanent lifespan. Well, yeah, no. And well, I think we've already kiboshed the sidewalk, so that's out the table. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, yeah. Yeah. You know, at this point, yeah. yeah. Just if we've got any other options to delineate it a little it's, bit. It's uh, just too bad that that's sand. Sand shed is wound up costing us so damn much money. It just don't make sense. In the ideal well, world, VTrans would spend its money more wisely and say, here's a chunk of money. You know best how to build it. Build here's it, two yeah. or three bottom line requirements instead of giving us the manual that requires us to do a lot of stuff. That That's oh, wasted. Yeah. 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 This, this is a typical example of getting grant money and having to follow mandates that come with it. Yep. Oh no, it is. That's it the is. boil down yep. version of it. Except even doing that, it's cheaper for us to do it the way we're doing it. Oh, we right, we could well, have had and built something with no help at all. But, it cost it cost it. Well, but we're still we're at we're, still, yeah. we're right at that point. You know, we're right at the point where, and again, I didn't vote for it, just more out of principle than anything else. But we're at the point where. If we were to build it ourselves, it's still going to cost us between 100 and 150 thousand. And as um, and and as we pointed the, out, it'll be more reliably consistent. And exactly, materials. and that you know we're getting a Taj Mahal that everybody can come and worship at. It's you know it should last a long time. It should last a long time. But going back to what I think we had this discussion, it would have been nice if the state had let us do our own thing and said, hey, we'll give you 50 percent. This is a that would have been a better deal for the taxpayers of the state of Vermont. Just a typical example of grant money it mandates. Is. It is. At their best. Yep. Or worst. It is. Or, or worst, whichever way you want to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't think anybody disagrees with your joke. Well, it's too bad. I mean, it's... Comcast for dispatch services. Yeah, we had a discussion, of course, at the last meeting about proposals for uh, increases or, or for fee assessments against towns who will be using the dispatch services to be rolled out over a four-year period. And previously, I think Representative Shaw had said, hold your horses, don't get too worked up. We'll see how it plays out in Montpelier. Since that time, I've corresponded with Butch, and he says, well, yes, we should take this seriously. And we've seen in the minutes tonight how Brandon has discussed the situation. Strangely, they, I think, see the cup as half full, that uh, uh, it's a valuable service and they weren't too concerned about the cost, whereas we are much more skeptical about the whole thing naturally here. But that's just two ways of looking at the same rollout. Anyway, I've asked Butch to give us an update because he said there was more hearings to be held about whether this agency even has the authority to do what it's doing. So we'll keep you posted, basically, That's is the bottom line. Safety, yeah, it's been, it's been I, an ongoing yeah. fight for the last six My six question years. would be, do we have any alternatives, or are we hooked into it 
have no choice but to at go the moment there. Joe we have no choice to go anywhere else there's no and right. the long, long run their own stuff wasn't there some there discussion but regionally about the Rutland Sheriff's Possibly. office well that's, that's yeah I mean, uh, here, though, so I, mean I mean <laughs> I guess my thoughts are if if this gets too outrageously expensive well, it then, might be better for Pittsburgh, Brandon, you know, West Rutland, Proctor, Chittenden, and mm -hmm. a bunch of towns to get together and have their own system. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's obviously we're going to have to go into this whether we want to, to or not with, to start with because yeah. you can't. But they're doing this CUD communication yeah. union, whatever. Yeah. Why couldn't the same thing apply to 911 services for us? In the in the future, yeah, so I, I, you know, I think there probably will be some options in the future, but I think right now, unfortunately, we're going to be stuck with this thing, you know, and it's outrageously expensive as far as I'm. It don't look good. Fifty dollars a call is ridiculous, but that's just my opinion. Well, you're, you're on the right track, I think. I'm following you. <laughs> it's right. possible. Just, just hope the bridges are all still intact, Joe. The enhanced energy plan. Yes, um, Mark Winslow, who made a nice, nice presentation of the Planning Commission's proposed enhanced energy plan, has followed up with a call. Just wondering if the board intended to take any particular action. Of course, it didn't at the time that he made the presentation, but now everybody's had, I guess, a little time to reflect on it, and. Um, I guess he'd be interested to know if you're interested in accepting it or approving it, taking some affirmative step to say that you appreciate it and that you accept it. I think that's what he's looking for. So Not, again, that it's legally binding, because as he points out, these are non-binding recommendations. Well, so now does that require us, because it's non-binding, can, can we just approve it, or do we have to have hearings on no, it? No, I think that's the case. I had some interaction with... Uh, regional planning and they said because it's non-binding it didn't look like there's any requirement for that kind of thing. Okay. This there isn't something uh, where the regional planning commission can tell us what we can or can't do. Well, if we wanted to um, have something legally binding and of course if you wanted to get credit from them for doing it exactly their way, you'd have to take the 14 Oops. steps that they proposed, which I think the board had no interest in following. No, to get their approval and the right. other one to get their approval yeah like john said there's 14 different things you've got to comply with it's probably actually more than that now mm -hmm. but anyway and then we would have to open up our town plan right. and we had issues getting our town plan passed right. so i we pretty much you don't want to give them a second bite at exactly we've got another what at least five more years yeah. on this plan i'm guessing yeah. so we need to just I don't know if anybody will agree with me or not, but I think the local control and input is shrinking all the time. Mm -hmm. And this might be one of those cases. Mm -hmm. It is, mm -hmm. but, you know, at least we're keeping it in-house. So. And at this time, the commission um, did kind of a modest set of recommendations, non-binding, without the need to jump through regional or state hoops. What are you looking for, Hank? Motion and a second. We'll make a motion and accept it. That's not binding. I'll, I'll second that. For the discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. And it's a carry. Very good. Thank you. I'll let Mark Winslow know. Update on the local hazard mitigation plan. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's time for the town to comply with the requirement to update its hazard mitigation plan every five years. You will recall that we applied for and received a grant allowing us to hire the Regional Planning Commission to facilitate and kind of run the, um, uh, run the business of updating the plan with the cooperation of a local committee. The local committee has been created consisting of myself, the town clerk, the highway foreman, um, the emergency management director, Selectman Hooker, and um, um, Kevin Blow from the um, Planning Commission. Um, we've met several times, and um, we will meet again this coming Wednesday. 
The plan is then to present a draft to the select board for an upcoming meeting, probably October 7th, uh, at which we will also invite members of the planning commission to attend and provide any input they have as well. So you will likely see this matter back on the agenda for the next meeting. Uh, and at that time, we'll basically have a chance to see the draft, comment on it, and then uh, ultimately give it some approval after a subsequent meeting on the 21st, I think. Good. Do you want to go to the pass right now? Uh, yes, we can do that, or we can go ahead and talk about the error and omission and the homestead penalty, and then we can make the call to our friend at the Regional Planning Commission if you'd like. All right, let's do that. Good. Uh, we do have an assessor error and omission, which relates to two parcels in town. And just to summarize, they are parcels 1899 and 1900. Um, parcels um, of land on Lee Road slash Gordon Hills and our lots four and five and lot two of the General Land Company's five lot subdivision owned by James Grace. General Land Company grieved their assessment this year due to an error in the acreage and an error of a pavilion no longer on General Land Company's lots but now on parcel 1900. Also an updated survey filed with the town in 2017 had never been recorded on our tax maps, so corrections were made to this, including creating a new parcel for General Land Company as the sale of these lots made the remaining lots one and three no longer contiguous. She, uh, given my short staffing, this is Lisa Wright writing, at the time and the busy period of Lister's grievances, I did not have time to make these E and O requests earlier, but I feel it's important to do them for the 2020 and to update our maps accordingly and have the 2020 grand list align with that. So the following are specific changes to these parcels that they're proposing. One, as to parcel 1899, owned by Marzalak, address Lee Road and Gordon Hills, uh, currently on our grand list as Sangamon Road. The property description is lot four, of 37.1 acres and lot 5 of 38.6 acres. The grand list value in 2020 was $162,400 and they're proposing an increase in value to $256,300. There was a sale price of $351,900 which is not the basis of this correction but it's interesting information to have. So maybe we want to deal with that parcel first. Or if you want to hear the second parcel, I'll do that. You can do it all together. Okay. Parcel 1900, just a brief description again. The owner's name is Heald. Again, on Lee Road and Gordon Hills. Again, maybe on Sangamon Road South, according to the grand list. It's lot, th lot three of 41.5 acres. The 2020 grand list value was $112,800. And the proposed change to the general list value would increase it to $180,400. Again, there was a sale price of $242,900. Again, as background information to support partially the change, the increase. Now this is Grace, Grace, Grace's land that's on the, off the Sagamon Road. It ain't, it ain't coming in from the other end of Blueberry Hill. It's no, I would like to make a comment on this. I don't know if this is, before we get done anyway, going along with what Joe says, as far as, and this may be something we want to bring up to our planning commission, this is not the only chunk of property in Pittsburgh that can only be accessed by going through another town as far as fire and police. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe our planning commission, when they do subdivisions, need to have something in the rules to allow them, before we allow these subdivisions, that somehow we have some kind of a mutual agreement with the town that we have to go through to take care of policing, fire, and, and now, our rest, now that we own our rescue squad, rescue squad also. Because they're going to have to go clear into Rutland Town and then back in. 
think I remember about 10 years ago being approached by Rutland Town about something going on in that general area of Blueberry Hill. I agree, John. I remember yeah, that. And, and wanting the town to commit to putting up some money. Right, and we said no. And we said no. Well, there's... But this, is, a, this is no doubt a different Fort situation. Hill, one time. Okay. I believe. If this is on the south side, south side of the Sagamon Road, it can't be too far to work. Yep. Grace owns land that borders Rutland Town Line. Yep. It does say well, that's, well, Sangamon that's, Road South. Yeah. Yeah. But there's no access well, from Sangamon. Okay. As far as what I'm, at least what I've been told well, I'm is, not, see, I'm not from, quite up to date from a couple different people, there's no access from Sangamon, so our emergency up. services that's have got to go clear right. down to up by George Levac's barn. Up by George yep. Levac's so barn and around in. Through George Levac's is through a chunk of land that we own. They have the right of way through it. Okay. And then on kind of bare east and go up onto the higher it's ground. It's up on the hill. Which is yep. up the lot. Yep. Now how does that, I don't think he owns clear through to the Sagamon Road. I think Dr. McGarry owns in between or the old McGarry place unless they purchase that. But I'm not aware of it. Well, yeah, I don't know. But I know from what I've been told by three different people at this point, there is no... There may be a horse path or something like that, but there is no access from Sagamon Road in Pittsburgh into this property. Well, I, I didn't think there was, but I'm not sure whether we're talking about the exact same spot. But in the event that some children have to go to school, That's they're another, in the town of Pittsburgh. No, how, how is that going? Some school What's going to happen well, there? Well, no, That's this is why... I mean, there's nothing we can do about this one. There's also another chunk that everybody's aware of that's this same way. I don't know how many others there's the potential for, but all I'm bringing up mm -hmm. is maybe the select board should tell the planning commission you need to figure out a way to protect us on this. Mm -hmm. As far as the fire protection, Pitzer and Rutland work together, yeah, and yeah. Rutland is within a stone's throw of it. Right. We have mutual aid. Pittsburgh is miles away. It's still our responsibility. Yeah. yeah. And when it comes to road maintenance, I don't know whether there's any chance that the town will wind up no, from what to take I over well, that. I asked on that. From what I understand, it's a private road. So if it stays that way, that's well, we would have to probably that be, we would have to turn it into a town road, and I don't think I don't we'll probably we do that. Would probably. I don't think we would. <laughs> so we would. you know, the highway part because. Again, well, it's Mark Winslow is one of the people, and I had him come in here and talk with Jeff because I brought it up to him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because the road was a, another concern, and he said, no, it's going to be, according to Jeff, by Susie, it's going to be a private road. So road maintenance isn't an issue, but now that the rescue squad is part of our town, mm -hmm. you know, our fire department, our police department, they're going to have to go into another town to come back in. and. Not as far as I'm concerned, for somebody to do that subdivision in the future, um, granted there's nothing we can do about this, mm -hmm. when you do that subdivision, they need to come up with some kind of an agreement with the town you've got to go through that mm -hmm. they will handle those things, mm -hmm. or the subdivision doesn't go through. Mm -hmm. yep. the Rutland, That's my opinion. The Rutland Town, I think, give them some contest on going, well, extending Rutland's the town road goes up as far as Levax, right? And then from Levax to the town line is, God, it's got to be three, four hundred yards up across there. And uh, Rutland Town didn't want any part of that road, and I don't think they have any part of that road right the way it stands. I believe it's all private. Yeah. It's all private. Yeah, but you better. Yeah, half a dozen houses back up in there, and that might put pressure to make some other changes that wouldn't be very favorable, especially when it comes to school kids. Well, so again, that's where my opinion is this board needs to instruct the planning commission to, to deal with this. Because this isn't the first time. And it'll continue. It will continue, and yeah, I don't know how many other spots we have like this, but we very well could have some more. And would the board like me to put a friendly bug in the ear of the Planning Commission about this topic? Oh, thank you, sir. Be happy to? Well, they should be aware of it. I don't know. Maybe yeah. they are. Well, they're aware of it, but I think the select board 
We need politely work. insisting that they do something wouldn't get it. I mean, it, it'll take them yep. months to do it anyway because planning commissions move pretty slow. Sure, but sure. I mean, even our group, I mean, it just does. Yep. It's the nature of the beast. Yep. Perhaps this board should make a recommendation to the planning commission that they consult us at least or something. Well, that's what, well, it'll have to when whatever they come up with zoning changes have got to come yeah. through us anyway. So. Issue. We all need to cooperate, and make it as easy as we can, but we got to make it right too. Well, we got to protect the town. Oh yeah, that's the bottom line. Not necessarily easy. Oh. No, but I got gotcha. you. Then that leaves the issue of these two errors and omissions, which we've already discussed, and which I will send to Kelly just so she has accurate minutes. We're just sending an email. Do it. <laughs> I know how she thinks now. More and more. And so what's your pleasure? I would make a motion that we allow Lisa to make these changes. I'll second it. Fair discussion? Some favor say aye. Aye. Those we'll say no. Fantastic. Thank you. Now John, we have the homestead abatement before we call them. Yes. Go. Um Carl and Jean Ojala have been in touch with Helen and they put their request into writing in tonight's packet. It is, according to Helen, the first time they've ever sought um, relief from a homestead um, declaration late filing penalty. In the past, I think the board has said um, it would be for one time for each person who asks for it, we would allow it, but that's completely up to you if you want to continue with that approach. They've explained that their accountant kind of dropped the ball and they'd appreciate uh, the, t the town waiving the penalty and the state does allow you to do that if you'd like. Well, the old you was very well and they're not the kind of people that are going to miss us the next time. They live on the corner. On, uh, so we have allowed this. Sort yes, I think it's just been like a one shot at the apple kind yeah. of approach that the board has taken. I hate to set a new person. No, we've already well, done, we've yeah. done this before. Yeah, we've done it. <coughs> I guess, uh, but I guess, uh, and I'm not saying I'm against giving them the break, but it was not. If it was our error, if somehow we had printed something out wrong or whatever, then I would say absolutely. But the fact that their accountant made the error gives me a little pause in that's not that's not our fault you yeah. didn't have an accountant who could do the job right just you know but i again i'm if the if the normal thing that we do is a one-time abatement or one time whatever it is we're doing how much money are you talking about hundred dollars yeah i'll make most we abated i'll second it Further discussion? All the bidders say aye. 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 Both say no. Well, no. It's, yeah. it's, I just want to make one, the point. It's not. Yeah, it wasn't our fault. I, I agree. And probably the accountant should pay the hundred bucks. <laughs> well, that I would agree with that. Yeah. 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 You know, but we've done it before. So. Okay. Well, no, and that's why I voted for it. If it was something new, why, I would, would I have fought to say no. Otherwise, I wouldn't even made the motion. Yeah. You know, but we've done it before. And, you know, if it was a thousand dollars, it'd be something different. Well, that's yeah. I hate to provide an easy way for somebody to make a mistake and get away with it. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. That's why I said the account should be the guy writing them a check for hundred dollars. Yeah. Can't be for an honest mistake either. No. Hey, Devin, it's John Haverstock. How are you? We're still. Yeah, we're still working. Um, we had tried to get in with you earlier, but you hadn't quite called into our meeting. And rather than listen to Don Ho music for the next hour and a half, we, we decided to hang up <laughs> and call you specifically. So I'm going to put you on speaker, okay? Yeah, let me just. Uh... Oh, sure. He's got to run upstairs to a quiet room. Oh. <laughs> Children uh, screaming in the basement. Uh, All right, so are you getting up there? <laughs> okay, I'm putting you on speaker now. My dog. Can well, you hear us, Devin? I can. Thank you, and if you would, you hear me okay? yeah, if you'd yeah. speak up, we have a primitive system here. <laughs> I'll do my best. So the board has your memo in which you describe the way the three towns have at least preliminarily talked about the possibility of a bike ped path between West Rutland, Proctor, and Pittsford, and possibly even Rutland Town. And I think your idea is that 
this would bring you know some tourism and perhaps some economic development and just give some more credentials for tourism for these towns to to advertise what else can you tell us about this project and uh, the grant funding that might go with it absolutely um, so you know uh, just as I said in the memo a little background you know we had we had discussed this project it met over the winter um, and there seems to be some good support and there seems to also be you know interest among the three towns possibly four about you know looking at kind of these alternative ways to you know bridge the gap between the local economy tourism and transportation and it seems like a no-brainer that you know there already are some known routes with some bicyclists um, currently between the three towns um, and that this might be a good opportunity to at least determine the feasibility of a potential tri-town bike loop or path or any variation thereof. Um, <clears throat> so these are kind of becoming more popular throughout the state. You know, I've mentioned one in the letter. Um, one, the one I mentioned is in Addison County, which got funded actually through their regional planning commission um, instead of the bike pet grant because they, they offer their own version of that. Um, but they seem to really have success using the kind of um, the hybrid version, which would utilize some shared use paths and some on-road paths as well, um, which would be certainly the most uh, you know cost-effective approach to implementing something like this. But the you know the scale is so big. And there's so many factors with these type of projects that, you know, we really like to scope them before, you know, putting any money towards them of, of significance. Um, and not only that, it typically when we scope these projects, it unlocks other funding uh, because it shows that we've gone through the planning process and we've done our due diligence. Um, so, you know, potential funding going down the road, if we <clears throat> fund this study and it it proves to be feasible um, and it proves to be a, a collaborative effort between the three towns. You know, we could look at certainly additional um, bike pad funding through the state that would fund and design construction, but we could also look at um, USDA rural development grants, which are now available for our region um, in the Rutland area. <clears throat> when initially they, they weren't available this far south. So that's a huge amount of funding with a pretty uh, small match con considering what's available there. So, you know, it's, there's potential that, you know, we, we could actually fund this um, from the scoping study. We definitely don't want to, you know, just have another study sitting on a, on a shelf somewhere. That's certainly not the goal. Um, but it really is... It, there's nothing like this in Rutland region. You know, we have a ton, a ton of trail networks, and we know there's a lot of interest and a lot of tourism around our trail networks, but there's not the same bicycle infrastructure um, within our on-road network. And that's really what's more um, accessible to not only our local um, residents, but our tourists as well. So. You know, I could really see this be a part of a large, larger project. You know, the state is considering, you know, uh, statewide bike bikeways instead of these scenic um, car vehicle ways. They're trying to think of how to do them with bikes. So, um, yeah, it's certainly it's exciting in terms of the opportunity. I think there's a lot of opportunity to kind of bridge those gaps. Um, do you guys have any specific questions or concerns? I'll, about, I'll, I'll jump um, in with just a like first this. one. I, yeah. I, I do think the, the fact that it is collaborative is really encouraging. And I think certainly the state and, you know, the RPC generally really likes to see that collaboration because, you know, we're all kind of in this together. We have similar problems and similar opportunities. Devin, just, just to start off, um, 
You, you like the idea because, you know, this area is a relatively flat and easily bikeable area. We have lots yeah. of people who make use of West Creek Road, for example, um, mm -hmm. and, and I know Whipple Hollow is another candidate. Uh, okay, and there's cool. also some back roads that could be looped in with maybe right. destination points like the um, Rutland Park, for example, as one maybe destination point. Um, yep. Is that what you have in mind? And am I right that a local match on a grant like this would amount to, for three towns, $2,000 per town? That is correct, yep. So we're looking, this a school uh, scoping study of this size is typically around $30,000, so that would be, you know, a, a five to $6,000 match. Um, and uh, I think you know, certainly VTRANS uh, over the last three years has not denied a scoping study request, which is really encouraging. But, you know, I, I think even if there were incredible competition, I think this would be a, a shoo-in project just because of, you know, that collab collaborative effort. Uh, I guess, so, are you talking of just using existing roads, or are you talking of actually putting a bike lane along existing roads, or are you using old rail beds? I mean, what uh, what exactly are we talking about here? Because I live on West Creek Road, and it's really, yes, there's a lot of people bike there, but it's not really a bike-friendly road. No. Right. And, and right. so while I am truly in favor of bike lanes and those kinds of things. I'm just concerned if you're not planning on actually putting a dedicated bike lane, yep. I, have, I have some concerns. Safety yeah. concerns. Hey, this Safety. sounds like Mills over there, is that right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it is. <laughs> All right. Good to talk to you. Um, so yeah, th those are absolutely genuine concerns. And, you know, I want to leave every option on the table for the consultant to look at. So, you know, ideally, I think it would be a hybrid of roads, off-road, multi-use paths, and potentially dedicated uh, bike lanes. However, you know, that's really, that's why we're bringing in the experts with a, a consulting firm to look at this. And, you know, this is what they do. They, this is by no means something new, and especially in rural communities like ours that, you know, some roads, might look great they're low volume but the cars that are on there are dangerous so you know i want to look at I, I would like this scoping study to look at all the options and maybe you know there's alternatives um certainly with these scope studies they have to buy you know by the, the rfp produce certain alternatives so one might be a full run road option, one, one might be a hybrid, one might be a complete multi-use path. So I think you're right. I think the we don't want to implement any project that puts people in jeopardy, especially, you know, we're trying to encourage bicycle use, not, not prohibit it or make it more scary. So absolutely, I think those have to be clearly communicated in the proposal, um, but I don't think they're deal breakers. And do you agree that if we, if the board were to go forward and approve this idea, that we're not obliging ourselves to any particular plan that might come out of this study? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, two things. One, if we don't you know, like, if we don't like the study, if they don't, if, yeah. I mean, you should because that it doesn't look great to get awarded something and then deny it. But let's say we did this feasibility study. And none of the options are great. You know, I would rather know that and eliminate that as, as a possibility than not know it, you know what I mean? And yep. have it fully vetted by a consultant. You know, I don't think we're going to get that answer where it's like, oh, there's no possible options here. Um, but yeah, there's nothing saying, you know, we do this study that you have to do anything. I mean, ideally we would because that's what we want is some sort of, you know, tangible you know, thing to come out of this, but yeah. So there is some security in that, in, in making the, the ultimate decision lies with the town. Okay, so essentially all you're asking for around $2,000 
chipped in from the town of Pittsburgh to do the study with no obligation in the end for us to accept the results, correct? Exactly. Okay. That's 100% right. right. Okay. And, and really, you know, at the end of this process, I think this would be a wonderful opportunity to, to have a, an excuse for the three, four towns to collaborate and talk. So, you know, maybe it opens up dialogue for a project or, you know, there's, there's more opportunity down the road. So I think no matter what, it's a, it's going to be a good result. So, yeah. yeah. We love most, if not all of our neighboring towns down. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we like them all. <laughs> Question yeah, they're okay, right? They're, yeah. still they're not going to move at, at least anytime soon, right? So. The question that uh, <coughs> Giovanni, uh, a question comes to my mind: Has anybody taken a map and a pencil and drawn any lines that they could? Yeah, show us? so you know that was kind of the first exercise we did over the winter, um, and there were a bunch. You know, we printed out a big map. And, mostly looked at the on-road options, but we were also looking at old uh, railroad beds that pass through Proctor. Um, mm -hmm. yep. So, the, it, you know, really it, it comes down to what you, what do you want to connect to, you know, and how direct do you want to make that? So, you know, it seemed to us just, you know, spending a few minutes looking at the map that there were quite a few alternative options to each road that we looked at. So, you know, if we didn't want to do West Creek Road, there was another one, you know what I mean? And certainly if there's anything we do along Route 3, you know, we're gonna have to really work B-Trans on that. And, you know, I think we've, we'd find that there would be some good support there as well. I don't know, the amount of truck traffic on Route 3 could be a problem. <laughs> no, but I, when I was back on the Planning Commission and I was one of the few people that brought this up, but. Route 3, uh, especially at that time, they didn't even have a store. And right. it was like, you know, uh, it's fairly level between Proctor and Pittsburgh along that route, and it would have been, well, when they just did the resurfacing and whatever, would have been an ideal time to have added a path on one side for walking and bicycles, you okay. know? and. Yep. connect the two towns together that way and I think actually a lot of people would use that yeah no I think you're right and I, I think that's kind of some of the appeal to this particular route is that it is so flat between these towns that it makes me feel like it's a lot more accessible than you know somebody trying to bike up quarter line road or you know some of these crazy hills that are all around so yeah I think you know yeah, that might have been a missed opportunity. Maybe it wasn't with the trans. You know, we, we'll never know. Um, but, you know, if we have this study now, any of that future state work, we can look to try to harmonize with any of those potential reconstruction projects. And who knows, you know, it, there could be some sort of surplus stimulus money coming down the pipe. I, I'm not planning on it, but, you know, that keep hearing about it. It would be good to have a plan in place if there were any any sort of, you know, influx of money. Yeah. With an election coming, it's tempting for Congress to crank out some money. Who knows? Yeah. couldn't bring a map and come and show us where they've drawn some lines. Okay. But I don't think, I, I, I don't think they're at that point. I mean, I think we're, you know, yeah, they're saying, yeah, maybe we can do this and whatever, but they need the consultants, they need the study. They need some money to go forward. Well, they need the study to draw the line. Yeah. So, the 2000, the 2000, the $2,000. Uh, let's say up to two thousand. Up to two thousand. So maybe less. less. Might be less. Well, if you do four towns, yeah, that's probably 1500. less. Yeah, fifteen hundred. I'll second that. I think. Fair I mean, discussion. if if 
well, if, for no other reason, just to, if they can get past to get bicycles off the road for yeah. safety concerns, I think it's worth at least looking into. So no, all the like. no. No. Yeah. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. opposed say no. Congratulations, Devin. Nice work. Well, thank you all, and uh, I'm looking forward to working with the town on this one. Good. See you, Devin. Have a good night. All right. Have a good night. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. I think that concludes our open meeting part of the meeting. It does. It does. I think it's right to come